the presentation of anarchism, anarchism. a social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. Anarchist Teaching Online by Sky Cruiser. This is a reflection on teaching with and also about the internet. Although we've escaped early dreams or perhaps nightmares about the internet as a separate space, disconnected from geography, from borders, from our physical bodies, internet researchers still frequently need to intervene with reminders that we remain embodied, even online. So, let me start by saying that I live and work on Noongar Budja, on Indigenous land now called Western Australia. I'm still unpacking what it means to live on Noongar land, and how to draw it into my research and teaching. Because in my entire undergraduate degree, we were taught almost nothing about Indigenous knowledge, let alone specifically Noongar knowledge. My parents grew up in apartheid South Africa, and I didn't, because my father had to leave the country to avoid conscription. That instilled in me a healthy distrust of the state and of state power. I definitely wasn't brought up with stories of nice policemen who would help you if you got lost. It was also a useful early education in the problems with nationalism. That was helpful because one of the many gaps in my political science and international relations degree was around anarchism. I'm not sure, in fact, that they mentioned it at all, except in the confusing and inaccurate claims that the global system of states is anarchic. When I found a small book of essays on anarchism, wandering through the library stacks, It resonated with me in a way that lectures about Hobbes and Locke and game theory hadn't. When I read Emma Goldman's autobiography, I enjoyed not just her rejection of authority, including other anarchists' attempts to get her to be quiet about birth control, but also her willingness to trace the flow of ideas between her and other people. Her willingness to acknowledge the ways that her politics shaped her relationships, as well as growing out of them. I also got the sense that she'd made a lot of really bad choices, some of them incredibly ill-advised, and that felt very relatable as a 20-year-old. However, by that stage of my life, the idea of a canon of reading was already pretty much ruined for me. I was sick of the books that I got told to read through my politics degree. I was sick of boys in bars telling me to watch boring movies full of violence or to listen to musicians who they claimed were geniuses, never mind their misogyny. So, I'll admit it now, I haven't read the bread book, as anarchists on social media affectionately refer to it. I can't frame my analysis of the internet in terms of what Bakunin might have thought if he was alive today. I cannot provide you with a well-cited analysis of whether we need anarchism because human nature is inherently awful, or whether we can dream of an anarchist future because humans are inherently good. I have no program for the perfect anarchist approach to education, let alone to teaching online. Still, I've noticed that being a scholar of anarchism doesn't guarantee that your practices will be anarchistic. Being a scholar who can trace out a detailed theoretical model of anarchism doesn't in any way seem to guarantee uh, anarchist teaching. And I like to think that reading the anarchist canon also isn't essential to putting anarchist ideas into practice. I am an anarchist, perhaps often a shoddy one, who is also a teacher which means, among many other things, that I never have quite as much time to read and think as I would like. Often, student emails and classroom preparation and various bits of bureaucracy are just more urgent, or at least they seem to be at the time. Nevertheless, over 10 years of teaching online and in the classroom, I've gained some ideas about how teachers who are anarchists, or a bit anarchistic perhaps, might approach their teaching. 
while I think these reflections might be helpful for people who want to teach about anarchism. They are far more about thinking how we bring an anarchist approach to teaching, and specifically to teaching while using the internet, and teaching within our current university structures. While I'm interested in, really enjoy lingering on, visions of an anarchist society, and I believe in the possibility of a multitude of futures that look very different from where we are now, I'm grounded in what we can do here in the world today to take us a few steps towards a more anarchist world. I'm not sure that an anarchist society would have universities. Judith Sousa, in her 2006 book, Anarchism and Education, traces some of the debates about what an anarchist education might ultimately look like if such a thing exists in, a form, in any formal way. There are people organising outside the formal educational system, with homeschool, with unschooling, with free schools and knowledge shares that take place in diverse abundance. And these practices are wonderful and important. Nevertheless, I'm here today and teaching in a university that allows me to buy groceries and cool t-shirts with a cab on them. So I'll do what I can in this space for now. I'm going to focus on talking about mostly individual interventions into teaching and especially online teaching at university. This is partly because it is what is most achievable for many of us as the insecurity of the neoliberal acad academy makes it difficult for many academic teachers to engage in more long-term and organised interventions into, academic, into university systems. The pandemic has first, further isolated many university teachers, and in Australia, the government's failure to provide support to universities has led to huge job losses and increased insecurity. Universities Australia estimates that about 17,300 academic job, jobs were lost in 2020, with casual staff most badly affected. About 13% of Australia's pre-COVID university workforce, according to a report in The Guardian by Nam Zhu. As Danny Spinoza has already discussed in an earlier episode, much of university teaching is already precarious. It doesn't even necessarily manage to consistently pay the rent for many workers. In addition to this, many university teachers may find themselves amidst departments with colleagues who don't share their ideals or who ha just have other priorities. Collective responses and collective organising will always have more power, but sometimes we have to do what we can in small, quiet ways. The university system has limitations and constraints, but teaching within a university also has benefits. It does allow at least some of us a little space to think, to share ideas, to gain access to a platform and to resources. Often when we talk about these things, about the impact of work within the universities, we focus on research. How, many grant applications ask us, will this research change the world? Teaching is often treated as an inconvenience getting in the way of the real work, even for people with teaching focused positions. But what a gift it is to be able to spend time inviting people to read and think to talk through ideas, to learn. University continues to be inaccessible to many people, and the Australian government's approach to universities in particular will make it more difficult for first-generation students, for working-class students, for Indigenous students, and for others who are already marginalised to make it to university. But nevertheless, this is one place where we have the opportunity to talk to people who would otherwise never read our research and who we might never otherwise get a chance to meet to talk to. My current department teaches all of our units through the Open Universities of Australia, which means that many of my students are older, returning to work, parents might have disabilities or have other diverse backgrounds and life experiences that mean that they're coming back to university after a break or studying while managing other responsibilities. This is quite different from my previous teaching experience where I remember being a little surprised to find that most of my students in political science at the time came straight, straight out of private school and intended to be lawyers, diplomats or work for the UN 
or possibly some combination of all of these three. I shifted to teaching internet studies, now digital and social media, in about 2011. The degree was taught in class, but we've always had a large cohort of students through open universities, so every unit is also designed to be taught online. The way university teaching works in Australia is a little different from some other places, so I am going to take a minute to explain it in case things work differently from where you are, my dear listener, or in case this podcast has somehow made it outside the confines of academia, which would be great. In some places, I've been a little horrified to discover the norm is for casual short contract teachers to develop their own units, including setting out which readings and activities to do and deciding on assessment. They then have to pitch these to university departments and the units that they create might run for many semesters or just once, depending on how the system works. Obviously, this has benefits in terms of allowing teachers significant autonomy over teaching and assessment. But it's also incredibly exploitative when it comes to the work and the insecurity involved. In Australia, at least at universities where I've taught, the norm, the norm is for more secure staff to develop units, working out the readings, lectures and assessment framework, which they, or more often these days, badly paid and insecure staff, then teach. This has the benefit of requiring a little less of insecure staff, but on the flip side it does often limit your autonomy as a teacher. If you're sessional staff you're usually delivering content that somebody else has designed, although you might have a little wiggle room within that. And if you're a teacher, if you're designing work, then you also need to design it in such a way that it can be taught by sessional staff who may only be available now and then, who you don't want to put too many impositions on in terms of what they have to, how they have to navigate university systems and the preparation they need to do. At my university, there are also separate processes and separate timelines for changing your unit outcomes, your unit titles and your assessments, um, as well as particular structures around what these can and can't look like. And this also creates limits and constraints. Now, for the rest of this episode, I'm going to focus on some of the specific interventions that I've tried within these constraints, focusing mainly on a unit called the digital economy. In doing so, I want to explore a few specific tactics that we can attempt in efforts to make anarchist interventions into university teaching. These focus on undermining hierarchy, rethinking assessment, encouraging collaboration, and imagining radical change. I was initially brought on to teach the digital economy on a short-term contract, and I remember actually laughing out loud when I was offered the job. Teaching about the economy very much did not seem to be my jam, let alone teaching about the ways in which the internet was accelerating capitalism. But when I started to look in more detail at the unit, I realized that although it started with utopian claims about the exciting new economic possibilities of connected networks, there was also substantial room for critiques of capitalism, with the second part of the unit focusing on alternatives to capitalism, or perhaps economic practices at the margins of capitalism, like gifting. The major assignment was structured around a collaborative assignment which seem to have a lot of potential for anarchist interventions. Now, over the last decade, and it seems really bizarre to know that it has been about a decade, but anyway, I've played around with the unit a lot and I've come to really enjoy teaching it. The process of undermining hierarchy in my teaching practice has been slow, probably slower than it should have been. When I first started teaching, I wanted very much to appear expert. I was completing a PhD in political science and international relations at the time, in a hostile, male-dominated and pretty stuffy environment. There had been limited room for uncertainty in the classroom when I was learning, for any reflection on how our life experiences could affect our analysis, even for the idea that political analysis could be subjective rather than being the objective outcome of rational evaluation. I remember still 
my lecturer's sarcastic responses when I tried to frame my own unsteady and personal feminist and anarchist interventions into the male-dominated canon we were presented with. It's taken me a while to unlearn the sense that everything must be perfectly cited and objectively presented, preferably in the third tense, to be acceptable. I still often find it uncomfortable to try to place my own analysis in relation to my life, my family history, where I fit into the world. It often feels like if I acknowledge boundaries to my knowledge at all, I won't be seen as someone who can know things. I'm trying to shift beyond the habits of formality and claims to objectivity that my undergraduate and to a degree also postgraduate studies pushed me towards. Teaching online, as I have since about 2010, makes that both easier and harder. When much of your teaching happens through text, it's easy to imagine the body away. It's easy to imagine that my students don't really notice that I'm a woman, that I'm pretty short, that I'm white, that I have this weird accent. And at the same time, I get time to carefully choose how to craft my divulgences how exactly to frame the ways that my background has shaped my analysis, rather than having it spill out awkwardly in the process of classroom discussion. It took me a while to feel comfortable taking out readings that were positioned as a key part of the canon in my discipline and replacing them with things that were more, more diverse and more interesting to me. At the same time, I've tried to be increasingly open with students about how my own perspectives, including my own politics, shape the units I teach. Uh, pointing them towards a chapter I've written in the Anarchist Handbook seems like one good way to uh, give them a bit of a, a tip as to where I stand. I'm also trying more and more explicitly to talk to students about the invisible ways that academia embeds hierarchy and exclusion. I talk to them about jargon in academic writing and try to reassure them that it's okay to not understand everything, to skip over some sections, to miss out on some readings that seem incomprehensibly dense. This is especially the case for multidisciplinary units, where rather than getting familiar with a single bundle of academic language, you're having to navigate different sets of academic jargon. It seems quite impossible to make your way through sometimes, and I try to reassure them that uh, academics do not magically find this less burdensome. As university teaching is increasingly making use of digital platforms, we should also look at the ways in which these platforms embed hierarchy, even beyond the other forms of exclusion and hierarchy that we see in the university system. The platform we're required to use for discussions can be set up, for example, to allow or disallow anonymous posts, to prohibit students starting their own discussion threads, to stop students from editing their own posts. How does that structure our interactions with students? If we use software that checks students' assignments for plagiarism, and incidentally, often then uses that data to make money, how does that structure our teaching? How does software like Proctorio, Respondus, and Onalock, which is meant to allow secure management of student examinations online, undermine student privacy? This proctoring software also has important impacts on accessibility and equity, with black students reporting, for example, that the software required them to shine bright lights on their face during examinations to avoid being labeled as cheating. The Electronic Frontier Foundation has tracked some of the successful campaigns against the use of proctoring software, often run by coalitions of students, teachers and parents. Targeting individual software is important, but overall we should be questioning whether we, sh we really need systems of assessment that rely on examinations, on surveillance and whether rethinking how we assess might move us away from digital systems that use students and teachers data and are constantly surveilling us and structuring our interactions in particular ways. Rethinking assessment is also very much tied to the idea of undermining, undermining hierarchy. 
Who ultimately decides what matters to students when it comes to their learning? Who decides whether or not students have learned successfully? Sadly, one aspect of my own teaching environment that currently seems immutable is the need to provide students with a percentage mark for each assessment and each unit. I'm pretty sure that most anarchist societies would not include marking or grading, or at least it would look very, very, very different from how it does today. Many of the experiments in anarchist education which Judith Sousa discusses, including Francisco Ferrer's Escuela Moderna, have tried to remove or de-emphasize grades, prizes, and other forms of competitiveness and external validation. Jesse Stommel, in outlining his blog post, Why I Don't Grade, notes that agency, dialogue, self-actualization, and social justice are not possible in a hierarchical system that pits teachers against students and encourages competition by ranking students against one another. Grading is also entangled in a university system that's increasingly based on the idea that all work of value can be chopped into easily measured, objectively evaluated, standardized and surveilled pieces, what Ursula Hughes calls logged labor. Assessment must fit into a few standard formats, with marks entered into electronic systems that can then be analyzed to look for outliers or problematic patterns. In many university departments, teachers are required to set assessments that can be automatically marked, like multiple choice tests. This allows both for objective, quote unquote, grading, and for cuts to teaching hours. And university teachers' work is expected to fit within the same model, with a certain number of hours allocated for preparing lectures, for marking each piece of assessment, for interacting with students, and so on. And all of this can of course be measured through surveys of student satisfaction with their teaching and other KPIs. Resistance to this assumption that both work and learning can be easily broken into standardized chunks which are then objectively assessed, preferably electronically, should tie together both resistance to grades and resistance to the ways in which academic labor is managed and surveilled. But in my situation, I have not worked out how to remove grades because they're so integral to how our system works. The best I've managed to do is to try to de-emphasize them and be clear with students about the impacts of grading, including sharing research on how grading undermines really good deep learning. For the digital economy, I've also tried to redesign the assessment in a way that shifts the locus of power a little. Their final project for the unit, a collaboration in groups from two to five students, is now marked partially by the teacher, but also partially by each other. Uh, The teacher marks the final outcome, the project that they publish, and then they mark each other mostly on their processes. This is admittedly a small intervention into the idea of the teacher as arbiter of correct learning, but it's what I can manage right now. Having students mark each other is also part of the process of encouraging collaboration. I have tried very much to make it as a way that builds in reflection and builds in the active development of collaborative skills. I've done this in part because my experience with anarchist organizing has definitely emphasized to me that we can't actually take collaborative skills for granted. We can't take organizing skills for granted. Learning to listen to others, incorporate different perspectives, speak up during challenging conversations, navigate and mediate disagreements, facilitate meetings and so on, are all skills that we actually need to actively work on. Students are given in my unit resources to learn these skills, including um, prompts to think about how they put them into practice, both in person and when interacting online using a variety of supporting technologies. I really want students to think carefully about how different online tools like text or video chat synchronous or asynchronous communication include or exclude different people, 
how they might make it easier or more difficult for people to work together and create things. So to support this, they do a short assessment with very few marks early on in their collaboration, which is mostly about guiding them to develop processes and to reflect on those processes. We ask them to outline how they're going to communicate with each other, whether there are any accessibility needs they'll have to account for, how they'll make decisions, what they'll do in the case of something going wrong, and also how they'll actively support everyone's contributions. At the same time, we provide them with a rubric which guides their final marking of each other through their collaboration. The rubric asks them to uh, reflect on each other's contributions to research, writing and publication, but also how well other students supported their contributions and how communicative they were, including letting other students know when they might be out of touch for a while. This is an attempt to shift from a focus on outcomes to a focus on process and specifically to supporting processes which are inclusive while also accepting and embracing that difference and friction can be useful and important. I like to daydream of a version of education where people don't just learn critical thinking and how to write, but also about how to be in good relation to each other. I also like to daydream about a version of anarchist organizing where we've learned how to listen well, how to handle conflict without splintering, and how to facilitate a good meeting that doesn't sap us of our will to live. So finally, I want to talk about imagining the possibility of change. I think that the humanities and social sciences are really good at finding problems, and that's valuable and important. A big part of the current version of the digital economy is questioning claims that the internet will somehow make capitalism sustainable by shifting us to consuming immaterial goods. Um, it's about demonstrating the horrific impacts of casualized work, the increasing power of platforms like Google and Facebook, and talking about the other problems with the current version of capitalism. However, I also think that a core part of a core part of anarchism for me is the strong belief that the world can be otherwise than it is now. It's profoundly depressing and disempowering to think that the best we can hope for is a slightly improved version of representative democracy, intertwined as it is with capitalism, colonialism, with patriarchy and homophobia and so on. It's depressing to think that Every single attempt to change these systems will always be problematic and doomed to failure. This is why I really like the second part of my unit, which focuses on alternatives to the capitalist economy, on cooperatives and gift economies, on barter, solidarity economies, peer-to-peer -peer economic systems. We talk about the massive changes that happened in response to the pandemic, at least in some places and about how other ways of working, sharing, and managing resources have always existed and still exist alongside capitalism and integrated within it, and how these systems could grow to be more important in the future. This is always a good place to quote Ursula Le Guin. We live in capitalism, its power seems inescapable, but then so did the divine right of kings. When I inherited the unit, the group project was structured around a report on a particular company and thinking about how the internet had shaped the growth of that company. Sometimes students came up with interesting projects and made good use of the open publication format, but overall the assignments were boring and long. And they tended to combine a timeline with a laundry list of concepts that we covered in the unit occasionally bringing in a little bit about online gifting or something more interesting, but generally describing, often in painful detail, the world as it is. I can blame only myself for this. Eventually, I realized that if I was finding it boring to mark these assignments, that probably they could be more interesting for students to actually do as well. So, 
I changed to a project where I asked them to imagine the world as it might be 10 years from now, drawing on concepts from the unit. The format is still open, with the only requirement being that they publish their work online. Some of them do podcasts or a series of blog posts. One group has done the front page of a publishing company with forthcoming books blurbs illustrating how they imagined the economy of 2030 working. I've really loved seeing what they come up with. I don't, of course, require them to imagine an anarchist utopia. It would be profoundly un-anarchist to do so. <laughs> Some groups imagine the world pretty much as it is now, just a little more so. Others have terrible dystopian visions of eternal gig work, insecurity and climate collapse. Some groups imagine a future where cooperatives dominate or where we have a universal basic income, where work might look fundamentally different, where we've seen radical forms of localization, where gifting plays a much larger role. I love seeing what students come up with when we invite them to stretch their imaginations, to consider that the world might be different from how it is now. The particular interventions that I've made in my teaching may or may not be applicable to your situation. But I hope that I've provided a few prompts to considering university teaching, whether online or in person, as a space in which we put anarchist ideas into practice, where we intervene in systems that are exclusionary, hierarchical, and focused on upholding the status quo. We can try to destabilize hierarchies, encourage collaboration rather than competition, and help others to believe that a different world is possible. Anarchism today exists in the cracks of existing systems, and I hope that like seeds putting down roots, we can widen those cracks, at least a little. Thank you for listening. To help others find anarchist essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.